Uh, good afternoon to everybody, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists. Uh, my name is Timofey Bordachev and uh, I work for the Valdai Club Foundation, uh, think tank number one in Russia and the platform for the development of international expert dialogue. And uh, I'm very glad to announce our lunchtime <coughs> session organized together with the uh, uh, Observer Research Foundation within the Racina Dialogue. And uh, the purpose of this session is to uh, approach uh, analytically how the Indian concepts and aspirations for the development of international cooperation uh, around Eurasia and on the maritime space can be connected and can develop a joint cooperation initiatives with the Russian continental aspirations reflected by the concept of Greater Eurasia. Uh, you know that Russia is a very long country in terms of the geographical distances, but Russia is not a big country in terms of the population. And in terms of the population, it cannot be considered as equal to India or China, for example. And this is one of the reasons why Russia is giving so much attention to the international multilateral formats and international forums and uh, peaceful cooperation based on uh, the joint common interests and visions between the nations which are crucial for, our, for the stability in our macro region. So I have a panel of very distinguished speakers, starting with uh, Minister and Secretary General of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, Mr. Vladimir Norov, distinguished Uzbekistan dipl and international diplomat. Uh, Mr. Tavari, member of Indian Parliament. Uh, our good friend, uh, Sergei Afonsov, member of Russian Academy of Science, one of our leading experts on international economics. And our American colleague, uh, Mr. Serchuk, uh, from the K, um, KKL consultancy, uh, I think. So we will have uh, quite a wide range of opinions and judgments about how this joint cooperative environment can be created and developed by the nations for whom stability in wider Eurasia and around it is a crucial matter of the national security. So uh, to be our first speaker, I give a floor to Minister and Secretary General Norov. And my question to him will be, how do you, you are actually leading, leading civil servant of the biggest regional international organization in this world in terms of the population of the countries which compose SCO? Uh, SCO has been seen by many as a an instrument for the continental cooperation, initially based on Chinese and Russian relationships. Of course, now uh, your organization extends the vision and extends the scope of the actions. So how do you see the role of SCO in the wider Eurasia cooperation and uh, its relationships with the Indian aspirations and ideas? Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Dear Mr. Bardachov, I thank you for invitation to participate in this important international platform today in its session, Raisina Dialogue. And uh, you are right that after joining India and Pakistan, SEO became the transcontinental organization which uniting perhaps half of population of the world and, uh, six, and uh, occupying 60% of territory of Eurasia. Today, uh, SEO have uh, eight members. It is China, India, uh, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Four observer states, Afghanistan, Belarus, Iran, and Mongolia. And six dialogue partners, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Cambodia, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Turkey. At the same time, additional uh, 10 countries have applied for observer or dialogue partner. Uh, status. It is Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Egypt, Israel, 
Maldives, Ukraine, Iraq, Vietnam, Bahrain, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates. So uh, perhaps 30 countries of Euro-Asia now uh, under e e the body in SEO orbit. It is essential that SEO, given its geographical expanse from Baltic to Pacific, play an active and inspiring role in world affairs. SEO was established in 2001, in the 15th June, after joining Uzbekistan to five countries which uh, made such uh, unity for on border confidence building. But it was time when Taliban, which is, uh, was close with Al-Qaeda and stayed on the border of Uzbekistan, and it was time when there was real threat to Central Asia. But uh, what I can say is that uh, the, in the, during 18 years, now SEO played an important role in the establishing peace and stability in this uh, vast area. And uh, what is important, the 2004 world established in Tashkent regional anti-terrorist structure, which were possible during these years to establish the atmosphere of trust and mutual confidence between the security services and law enforcement agencies, which uh, were very important for uh, uh, exchange information and organizing common efforts against terroristic and extremistic organization. What is important that SEO play an important role and uh, fighting against drug trafficking from Afghanistan, which till now uh, became the main exporter of opiate. Where during five years, we were possible, our member states, to seize more than 40% of all drugs which directed through Central Asia and Russia to Europe. And at uh, the same time, what is important uh, to say that uh, our organization will, will, uh, base it on the special uh, principles. One of them is that openness, non-direction against other states and international organization, and our organization not non-block nature. And what it is important to mention, that the main uh, uh, model of decision-making, it is consensus, uh, based on equal dialogue, mutual respect, and consideration of interests of all member states. So, regardless the uh, uh, political or economic potential territory of population, the all countries have the equal right. No one decision will be taken without consensus. The, uh, <clears throat> there is no domination, the element of pressure or cohesion. Uh, and uh, our organization certainly engaged in, uh, in politics and security and trade economy and cultural humanitarian cooperation. The, and uh, giving this continued threat of terrorism, drug trafficking, and cross-border organized crime, crime, the first stage was certainly development uh, activity aimed at ensuring security and stability, as I said before. And uh, in this area, this uh, result is achievable, and it was recognized by world community. And uh, for example, in one of the, his recent statements, Mr. Guterres, Secretary General of United Nations, specially give attention to this, that SEO plays a leading role in regional diplomacy. It contributes to the development of mutual cooperation to sort out the most urgent issues of peace and security in Euro Asia. The SEO activities are aimed at building a democratic and fair architecture of international relations, based on the principles and standards of international law, primarily mutual respect, justice, equality, mutual beneficial cooperation, and common vision of creating a community with shared future for humankind. We support the efforts of the UN as a universal multilateral organization and the UN Security Council in maintaining peace and security, international peace and security under the Charter of United Nations, stimulating global development. At the same time, our, we advocate improving architecture of global economic governance and development trade, economic and investment cooperation. We believe it is important to further deepen cooperation for jointly and consistently strengthening an open, inclusive, transparent, non-discriminatory multilateral trade system based on the rules of the 
World Trade Organization, as well as preventing any unilateral protectionist measures in international trade. That's, uh, I think it is important to mention it because some of our countries facing such in recent uh, time, that's uh, steps taken uh, against some uh, member states in the trade economic field, but it is not for benefit, uh, not only the, to these countries, but the world economy. And uh, we see this in this time, uh, uncertainty in economic uncertainty on world uh, markets, uh, the, the, the diminishing the development of world economy. And uh, that's why we're looking forward this, uh, this approach of ACO will be uh, adopted by others too. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Uh, Mr. Tavari, uh, India is one of the three biggest nations and biggest powers of Eurasia. And uh, definitely the future of cooperation in this macro region cannot be considered without the active Indian participation and Indian in input. But as with every sovereign nation, the participation of your country is based, should be based on the national interest, national considerations and national vision of this multilateral cooperation. So what will be your take on the Indian approaches to the wider greater Eurasia concept and uh, the connectivity between Indian oceanic maritime aspirations and Russia's continental aspirations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, may I commence by first thanking the Observer Research Foundation for inviting me back again to the Raisina Dialogue, which uh, over the years has uh, become an institutional fixture in Delhi, which uh, attracts a lot of uh, good minds from uh, all across the world. And as I see some uh, friends in the audience, I would like to caveat my remarks by saying that uh, whatever I say, I speak for myself. I do not speak for the other hat which I wear. So, so, so I think that we should kind of make it clear. And uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, when I first looked at this, uh, very interesting subject, uh, a new arc of cooperation and rising Rimland from Vladivostok to Chennai. Uh, on uh, first glance, it kind of reminded me of uh, the kind of exotica that the bureaucracy shells out when heads of state have nothing substantive to discuss. On, uh, on, on, uh, a second brush, you know, uh, on a lighter note, since people are having lunch, I can almost imagine my, my Madrasi friends, as uh, we North Indians colloquially refer to all South Indians, actually uh, shivering in their lungis and then their wasties in the cold of Lenny Wastuk. And on a third reading, I think there are serious questions with regard to the sustainability of the chennai Vladivostok maritime relationship or the maritime link. The fact is that uh, the far eastern district of uh, Russia is the least populated. Yes, of course, there is some amount of diamonds out there and there is some amount of interest that the some Indian companies may have in uh, in, in diamonds or in uh, minerals or, you know, there are some armament factories out there. But on a larger macroeconomic scale, till the time the northern sea route does not become viable and uh, you do not have climate change to such an extent that the polar ice actually allows you uh, to go from uh, Vladivostok to St. Petersburg more than three months a year, I uh, doubt the viability of the chennai uh, uh maritime route. Uh, it, it, it only makes economic sense if it becomes a transit point for goods and services from Asia 
to be able to uh, further go on to Europe rather than really stop uh, in Vladivostok or, you know, kind of have an arc which goes up from Chennai to Vladivostok. <clears throat> the fourth thing which I would like to say, and uh, if I am sounding contrarian, it is also because I am trying to be deliberately provocative, is that uh, a lot of self-styled uh, strategic gurus uh, have come out with uh, very exotic and esoteric concepts over a period of time. Uh, one of them, of course, is called the Indo-Pacific. I do not think uh, that the Indians exactly understand uh, very clearly as to what the Indo-Pacific even means to themselves. And uh, then there's a new one which I started hearing recently called the Indo-Arctic. So I think uh, the reality is that you have bodies of water and there are countries which have uh, uh, interests, strategic interests, commercial interests in their, uh, in, their in, the, in the waters closer home. And so therefore, as you traverse from uh, India uh, into the Far East and then up to Vladivostok, you have India which has legitimate interests in the Arabian Sea, in the Bay of Bengal, in the Northern Indian Ocean, as you go further, other countries have similar interests. And as long as the Chinese do not really consider South China Sea to be their own lake, and as long as they keep the sea lines of communication open, as long as they allow free trade and transit, irrespective of uh, the maritime silk route or whatever other concepts they have been able to put on the table because Many, many years ago, you know, Deng got the economic model right. And so from an impoverished communist country, China evolved into a totalitarian uh, capitalistic uh, paradigm. And so the Chinese have made a lots of, lots of money. And the Chinese obviously want to throw that money around and, you know, really have a party. And so therefore you cannot blame them for doing that. If somebody has that kind of money, they possibly have the right to throw it around. But having said that, as long as the... You know, Chinese respect the rules of uh, international engagement. They keep the sea lanes open. Uh, you know, if let's for, for, you know, if you want to have uh, a maritime silk route, you want to have another uh, waterway or another maritime link from the Chennai to the Vladivostok. You know, the more the merrier. And uh, I would like to end by really saying that if let's suppose at some point in time this rising arc of Rimland influence from Chennai to the Vladivostok was to actually evolve into a strategic concept, then you would also be looking at the Malakka dilemma in the reverse. You know, what uh, really bedevils the Chinese today would start uh, bedeviling you also as you try and flesh this concept out. And so therefore, uh, let me stop here and uh, leave it to my fellow panelists. Yeah, uh Thank you very much, our minister. Uh, well, uh, I can explain that uh, from our initial perspective, the idea to discuss this chennai Vladivostok cooperation was based on this uh, geopolitical reading of the India and China representing the countries of the so-called Rimland surrounding the great uh, Eurasian space. And accordingly to our initial approaches, <coughs> Uh, the genuine cooperation with the rise of Rimland ha will, can help us to make this region not the area of the contest, but the area of extended cooperation. Uh, and this brings me back uh, to our first speaker, Mr. Norov, uh, before we go for our <clears throat> other distinguished colleagues. What do you think is what the main contribution of India in SEO so mm -hmm. far? As, uh, as I told in the beginning that by joining India, our organization became transcontinental. Uh, India is very active participant in Asia activity. And during last two summits in the Tsindao in Bishkek, our Prime Minister of uh, India, Mr. Narodi Modi, made several initiatives for strengthening security, cooperation in field of security, economic cooperation, and first of all, in agriculture, in IT, in space, pharmaceutic, medicine, environment protection, alternative energy. What I can say that uh, recently the in the India initiated special exercises for disaster management. And uh, here was 
uh, uh, meeting of uh, head of agencies in this area. This year, uh, India will pr have presidency over the second important mechanism uh, of our organization, the uh, meeting of head of governments. It will be in November here, and uh, it is uh, directed, this organ directed to developing cooperation in the economy, a humanitarian field, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, it will be preceded by the ministerial meeting, ministers of economy uh, and the ministers of uh, justice and several expert meeting, national coordinators. But what is important to mention that India take initiative for organizing first meeting of consortium economic think tanks consortium. We are especially uh, proved this year in Bish uh, last year in Bishkek summit some document regulating this consortium because as we see the potential of economy of SEO is growing. Today GDP of SEO it is 22% of world GDP and some by prediction uh, it will be rise 2030 to 35 40%. And World Economic Forum uh, in beginning last year published the 10 economies of the world. It will be 190 trillion US dollar. So from them, 60%, it will be economy of China, India, and Russia. That's why we now focusing on economic cooperation during 18 years, 1,400 documents adopted in ACO. 46% was directed to security stability. It is understandable. And now uh, only 7% to uh, economic and humanitarian uh, year. And India now take responsibility to be the active member in developing economic cooperation. The same time, initiative of Russia and India to construct transport route north and south, which is more than 7,000 kilometers, which will connect St. Petersburg with Mumbai, certainly playing important role uh, as uh, developing such cooperation between uh, trade economic cooperation between member states. And uh, it will give chance as a, a new planet uh, transport route, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, will give the, to Central Asia the possibility, landlocked countries. Among these landlocked countries, Uzbekistan, double landlocked countries, to have access to the seaports, Indian seaports, and to world market. Last month, Mr. Guterres made some statement about uh, need, it is, is that world community should support the countries of landlocked countries, which is in export of which 60, 70%, it is a price of the good. That's why, uh, in the, another initiative uh, of uh, uh, India and Russia to can have kind of mari maritime connection from uh, uh, Chennai to Vladivostok, it is very important because Russia is focusing on developing Far East and the idea of a big Euro Asian partnership initiative, which uh, announced by uh, President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, is uh, mean that they're in this big area the two, two important platforms like SEO and ASEAN will play important role because in now is economic development as Mr. Macron recently openly confirmed it is moving from the west to the east and to this organization SEO and ASEAN will play important role and the Euro Asian Economic Union is certainly in this area uh, will be uh, crucial uh, its role, but at the same time, our organization is open for cooperation with other uh, or regional organizations like European Union, and we're proposing such cooperation and to be uh, uh, such effective for developing our Eurasian continent. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and thank you as well for mentioning this uh, European angle. Uh, of the wider Eurasian cooperation. Though, of course, when the European politicians speak about the rise of Asia, it reminds me uh, the brilliant note of one of the Italian writers who wrote that, I mean, according to uh, one of the uh, representatives of Italian aristocracy, that in order to stay the same, everything must change. So I think that Europe believes in the rise of Asia because Europe wants to use the rise of Asia in order to preserve the, the leadership of Europe. But, uh, Mr. Afonsov, as someone who does international relations for the decades, I believe that politics always have a priority over economics. Uh, as you are one of our distinguished economists in Russia, I think you have a different view, and I am very much your 
to know your opinion on how the conditions of global economy meet these uh, geostrategic aspirations, what are the limitations and what opportunities the present condition of world economy gives us? First of all, as a political economist, I should confess that my personal opinion is that politics and economics go hand in hand. And if we look at uh, Russia's pivot to the east, this is uh, by far uh, by far more true than in many aspects uh, of uh, international relations now. Uh, you, Timofey, mentioned the continental aspect of uh, Russia's eastern strategy. Uh, I would say that this aspect is probably the most visible as of now because of uh, remarkable diplomatic efforts, because of uh, transportation projects, because of trade turnover. But still, this is not the only aspect of Russia's strategy. The Pacific dimension of this strategy was always in place, and we can recall uh, uh, Russia led uh, APEC summit in Vladivostok uh, even before the uh, slogan of the pivot to the east was coined. Uh, since then, unfortunately, the situation in uh, with the cooperation of uh, Asia Pacific countries and in the Pacific region in general has deteriorated, first because uh, APEC was substituted by a uh, less inclusive idea of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, then the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, found its end, and now we have another less inclusive uh, idea of Indo-Pacific uh, cooperation. But still, this less inclusive interpretation of uh, Indo-Pacific cooperation is, once again, only one possibility. Uh, we would prefer to uh, look at Indo-Pacific idea in terms of the inclusive project, which will bring together Pacific and Indian Ocean regions uh, as a common uh, space of security, but also of common space of, space of economic cooperation. And in this sense, Russia's pivot to the east and its Pacific aspect can be easily merged with the idea of the Indo-Pacific uh, aspect of Russia's uh, uh, international economic policies. Uh, if we look at the scale of uh, Russia's economic cooperation with India, we can find not very pleasant uh, uh, fact that, for example, the share of Russian trade uh, which uh, we uh, conduct with India is uh, very stable at 1.6%. Uh, last year, the share of Russian trade with China surpassed 16%. So Russia trades with China 10 times uh, as more intensive as with India. Why? Because of the distance. Not geographical distance, but economic distance. Geographical distance is measured in miles, in kilometers, but economic distance is measured in rubles, rupees, or if you like, in dollars. So the idea of Indo-Pacific for us is the chance to uh, decrease economic distance between our countries to uh, make our trade relations and also our investment relations uh, more energetic and to gain uh, more uh, with the uh, general efforts to bring together Russia's uh, East Asian and South Asian economic potential. For us, this is the opportunity to bring prosperity to our people. I hope for Indians so. But also this uh, is uh, the initiative that can bring uh, benefits to the third countries. Uh, for example, to the countries of uh, East Africa, mentioned by Minister Lavrov 
to, uh, today uh, in the morning. Uh, but economic gains, trade, investment, technological cooperation is not the only thing we can wish for. And once again, as a political economist, I would like to stress political implications of this potential inclusive in the Pacific initiative. Uh, now we are facing significant challenges to the global regimes, both in security and in economics. Look at uh, the situation with security regimes. Two of three major treaties uh, that used to be the pillars of international security are now dead. And the third treaty is, you know, with one leg in the, in the grave. Uh, why? Uh, clearly because of the position of the current American administration. It seems that the attitude of the current American administration towards the global trading regime is the same. And if nothing changes, we will be witnesses of the demise of global trade regime, of the liberal trade regime in general. So the uh, strategy for responsible politicians and economic experts would be to use each and every opportunity to bring to existence new cooperation mechanisms to prevent this scenario from being realized. With this task, we can rely on the existing organizations. First of all, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS. But also, we can think uh, on the bilateral or multilateral ad hoc task forces and, uh, uh, you know, um, probably some uh, agreements between our countries to insist on the necessity to keep with the liberal trading regime which takes into account national economic interests of our countries, not in the pursuit of the ideological uh, values of free trade in general, but for the sake of economic benefits, for the sake of building trust, and for the sake of building economic fundamentals of the new and stable international security regime. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tavari, uh, the trade has been mentioned uh, for the couple of times and the modern tendencies in the development of international trade. The trade of India with major partners like China, the United States, and even Russia are, is are limited by the certain uh, objective geographic circumstances and by the real ability of the partners to provide the goods which are needed. So do you consider the trade relationships as a crucial factor? Do, they, do you think that they still play such a crucial role in the development of international cooperation? Or nowadays it would be a very narrow reading of this? Well, I think uh, it's a mixed bag. And uh, I just wanted to contest the premise that distances uh, can actually be a detriment with regard to either bilateral relationships or trade relationships, because uh, if you were to rewind back into the past, uh, India and the former Soviet Union had a very robust relationship uh, across the board, uh, be it trade or be it a strategic relationship. And I do not think distance was uh, ever an inhibiting factor in any sense of the word. Having said that, uh, there is a general disappointment across the world with the uh, multilateral trading uh, regimes. Uh, the U United States was mentioned that uh, they've kind of pulled the plug uh, on the uh, TPP. But even if, let's suppose, you were to rewind back uh, to President Obama and the Asia pivot, while some uh, aspects of the, or the, some strategic aspects of the Asia pivot were still quite evident. I do not think the, the economic vision uh, was ever spelt out in detail. And even if you, let's say, talk about India, 
we've recently pulled the plug the nda bjp government the current government has pulled the plug on the R rcep and we've said that uh, the rcep does not really uh, factor in india's economic interests at this point in time so under those circumstances increasingly trade rather than multilateral is also going back to the bilateral paradigm where countries are figuring out their own national interests and seeing as to what's the best bang for the buck they can get out of a bilateral uh, relationship rather than being constrained by these multilateral arrangements okay excellent thank you so the united states are very well known for their um, uh, for their inclination to develop the bilateral relationships especially with the great powers and uh, generally i am afraid but i must say that uh, by many observers in russia the role of us in uh, in wider eurasia is considered to be as a role of for uh, semi spoiler not a responsible contributor so what will be your analytical approach to these multilateral relationships in eurasia and how do you think it can fly in the future Well, спасибо большое, Тимофей. Um, we, we briefly discussed whether or not, since our Russian uh, friends uh, have been speaking in English, as the American on the panel, I should uh, speak in Russian, um, but, but concluded that that would probably be a violation of the Geneva Conventions, given the, the quality of my accent uh, after, uh, after so many years. Um, I, I will say at the outset, um, thank you to, um, to the Racina Dialogue, for uh, for bestowing at least for the purposes of uh, the next hour or so on the United States the status of an observer uh in the uh, the Shanghai cooperation agreement uh not not a status that uh that I ever expected to be uh, to be personifying um but uh Timofey to your point I'll try not to be a a personal spoiler with respect <laughs> to the discussion um look I I think maybe the the a point of departure um from a, at least an American perspective um is you know wh whatever the virtues of american foreign policy over the last uh, 20 years a uh, consistency constancy and predictability are probably not words that immediately spring to mind um but with respect to india the united states over multiple administrations democratic and republican has actually pursued a very consistent policy um and that has been the pursuit uh not only of strategic partnership um with india um but also um strong support in principle and in practice for the rise of india um as a global power and the growth of indian power uh in the world all dimensions of that power uh, economic diplomatic uh military technological um you know some have suggested that the the impetus behind this uh is that the united states wishes to entrap india uh in some sort of uh alliance against china um my personal reaction to that is that maybe uh, overly flattering to america's uh, capabilities uh, i don't think that the united states um has the ability to pull the wool over the eyes of uh of india uh civilization it's practiced statecraft for thousands of years um rather i think what what is going on here um is a fundamental recognition um that the growth of indian power um is in the us national interest um and that india's rise is uh an indispensable component in the whatever you wish to call it balance of power in Eurasia, Indo-Pacific, pick your preferred term. Um and that likewise, you know, there's a, a sense of shared interests and shared values uh that sustains this. It's not the expectation that the United States and India are going to evolve into a a 20th century style alliance. Uh it's not even the expectation that the United States and India see eye to eye on every issue. We most certainly don't. Um but it is the the belief again that india as it becomes more prosperous more powerful um will be able to assume a role in the international order which is fundamentally good for the kind of international order that the united states has historically sought and supported 
Um, it is also, I think, a, a, a recognition um, that even when we do disagree, um, when we don't see eye to eye between the United States and India, as invariably happens in any relationship, um, there's a fundamental respect uh, for the democratic process by which India reaches its decisions, um, and a fundamental respect for the internal processes that play out here in this country. Um, and when we come here to Raisina uh, and see the dynamism, the diversity, uh, the, uh, the youthful uh, energy, uh, and, and the energy of the debates that we uh, that, that play out here, I think that that's also, frankly, something that, that really brings back to us the, the, the energy behind this relationship. Now, with respect to the, the question of the, the Eurasian balance um, of power, you know, I, I think that, that here, too, you know, American grand strategy uh, over the course of decades has actually been fairly straightforward in one sense. You know, the United States has consistently opposed um, the domination of any sphere of Eurasia, Europe or Asia, uh, by a single power. Right? The interest of the United States has been for there to be some kind of equilibrium. Now, um, you know, with respect to the wonderful quote that you had, Timofey, about you know, in order for things to stay the same, things have to change. Um, you know, I think we all recognize that the balance of power in Asia has been changing, and that, that is um, due to a, a variety of factors. Um, but you know, one of the most complicated and, and most um, significant has, of course, been the rise of China. Um, and you know, China's success uh, has been a blessing, in my view, for uh, its own people. It's a, a, a tribute to the dynamism, to the, the energy, uh, to the innovation of the people of China. Um, and it's also been a blessing for large swaths of the rest of the world, including my own country. Um, there's no economic relationship which is more important uh, to the United States um, than the US-China relationship. Um, and China has also benefited from a system that uh, the United States, together with other countries, um, uh, helped put in place in the aftermath of World War II. Um, we actually, I think, also owe a, a certain debt of gratitude to the Soviet Union for that system because it was created uh, in no small part uh, also in reaction um, to our own geopolitical competition, a reflection of the fact that the geopolitical rivalry, while it can be quite dangerous, can also spur innovation uh, and, and human progress of a sort. Um, China has benefited tremendously from its integration into that, that international order, that e international economic system. But as China has become more prosperous and powerful, it has also leveraged some of that power and prosperity in ways that um, have certainly unsettled parts of the region um, and raised questions about that, that balance. Um, my own view is that we all have a fundamental interest in sustaining a positive relationship with China. Right? India has China as its neighbor. Russia has China as its neighbor. We, as the United States, although we're separated by an ocean, it's a small planet. Uh, and we are a Pacific power ourselves. But the question of how we sustain that balance is really the critical one at this time. Um, the Eurasian context, in particular when we think of, of Central Asia, the United States is less relevant in that context. But the way in which India, Russia, and China work out their equilibrium, I think, is a, a, a key question. Um, with respect to economic integration, I think that every country in the world wants to benefit from economic integration with China. Every country in the world wants to benefit from the technological ingenuity that is taking place in China. The challenge is how do we ensure that economic integration does not lead to geopolitical subjugation? Um, and, and that is really the, 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 the balancing act that I think we all are trying to, to navigate. Um, I, I am hopeful um, when I look though, however, across Eurasia, that this is ultimately a region which is too big, too diverse, too dynamic for any country to, to dominate. And I think that the, the wisdom ultimately uh, of, of every great power uh, has to be to recognize that fact. Um, and then in turn, try to find uh, concepts of legitimacy as well as balance of power that will enable coexistence over the long run. But that is going to be 
a work in progress. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yes, indeed, the region is, is unique because of the presence of uh, three global powers. And it means uh, that no domination by the single country is ever possible here. So the, all the three major powers, China, India, Russia, are in a way imposed to cooperate between them. Uh, China events in your intervention has been mentioned for the several times, and I'm very glad to welcome our colleague from Zhenmin University, Ms. Chen, uh, and uh, to listen what will be your opinion on the evolution of Chinese approaches to the multilateral cooperation in wider Eurasia and on its immediate and very important periphery. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I think when nowadays, at least from the uh, dialogues I've been involved in back home in China. It's quite interesting that when we nowadays when we talk about the uh, major power competition across the world and in this region, I think the essence or the nature of it has undergone quite fundamental changes. Traditionally, people automatically think of military security or uh, the strategic alliance, but nowadays the importance of industrial chain, I mean the uh, global industrial chain, the entire industrial chain has gained unprecedented importance. In the past couple of years, you can see that the major powers across the world and in uh, this part of the world, all of them, China, India, uh, the, uh, Russia, uh, and even Canada, um, Japan, and also uh, the EU, all of them have issued their industrial policies. Uh, to gain or sustain uh, quite good advantage on the entire chain. And uh, uh, today is a quite a special day because uh, today China and the United States is going to sign the uh, first stage agreement on the trade war. But my uh, personal perspective is that I think the trade conflict is just a quite superficial um, conflict, quite superficial symptom. Behind it is uh, uh, structural conflict uh, in the struggle over the entire global chain. Uh, if you look at the uh, Trump administration's whole package of uh, industrial policies, you see it's a regaining of the dominance along the entire uh, global uh, industrial chain, not just uh, to sustain the leadership of the technological industries, but also to regain the dominance of the lower and uh, middle end uh, industries. And, uh, um, but meanwhile, China is trying its best to mobilize both the state resources and market resources together to efficiently uh, execute its own industrial policies to climb up along the, this uh, industrial chain. So this is where um, the um, fundamental reason lies in terms of the structural conflict behind China and the United States. I think nowadays, from China's perspective, I think it's quite interesting um, that, uh, at least from my talks back home, um, uh, there are, we, um, because my PhD studies focus on economic history, so if you look at the uh, rise in economic power in history, there are several models. Uh, the United States itself, back in late 19th century, uh, when the United States was an emerging country, actually the United States suffered from the least pressure at that time, because A, it didn't rely heavily on the uh, existing international order, dominated by the UK back then. And B, it also didn't uh, suffer from strikes from the uh, UK at that time. Uh, so uh, in history, throughout history, the United States, as a rising economic power in history, uh, faced the least challenges. Then you also have the model of uh, Germany and the former Soviet Union, which was also relatively independent from existing international order at that time, but they did suffer a lot from the strikes from the dominant player at that time. So the result is that they had the most uh, confrontational uh, conflicts, direct confrontational conflicts with the existing dominant player. And then the third case is the Japan. It relied heavily on, on the existing uh, order dominated by the US, uh, and uh, it also suffered the strikes, direct strikes from the United States. So, so far, Japan is the worst, uh, faced the worst, uh, worst challenges when it was a rising economic power. If you ask my opinion on China's position, I think uh, China, China's case is uh, closest to the scenario of Japan 
but it uh, but it's worse. It's a worse scenario for Japan uh, for China because in at least in 1980s or 1990s, Japan was still a strategic ally of the United States, and uh, Japan was tolerated by the United States to continue to develop within the system. Uh, but nowadays in uh, Washington, uh, when there is lots of talks about disengagement, uh, and uh, in China, I think. Uh, uh, if you look at the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, I do believe one big focus is to, rely, uh, to reduce, to a certain extent, the reliance on existing uh, international order dominated by the United States, because that means huge risks. Uh, and the pragmatic approach of China is to build a relatively healthier um, and more independent economic structure in this region. Uh, for example, uh, when we do the trade, uh, if you look at the uh, statistics, you will find it um, kind of disappointing that one third, only one third of the exports of, uh, produced in this region uh, is ultimately consumed in this region. And the United States itself, the US market itself consumed uh, one third of the uh, exports from this region. And I think uh, the BRI, one of the focus is to change China's position of playing just as an intermediate market between the developing economies and developed economies uh, toward to be a major consumer uh, goods market for this region's uh, 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 exports. So I do believe uh, there's quite consensus now that manufacturing is uh, indispensable for uh, any rising economy, uh, both developing uh, economy and developed economies. I think the United States have also realized that uh, uh, after the three decades of economic financialization and economic globalization, they do believe they should also um, take the manufacturing jobs back. And for uh, developing countries in this region, it is a widely consensus that we should not, we should develop our uh, real economy to consolidate our a real economy, and in th this regard, there's lots of consensus uh, to uh, uh, compensate our each other's economy, and especially to interconnect our uh, basic infrastructure. Uh, uh, just now, uh, my colleague from Russia actually already touched upon the interconnectivity between China and uh, Russia. Uh, I do believe the uh, one of the major focus between the EEU and BRI is the transportation interconnectivity. So I do believe China's approach is quite pragmatic. Uh, uh, just now we already reviewed the history. On the one hand, China has no example to follow because its case, its challenge is even greater than Japan. But on the other hand, China is also cool-headed that it's, um, it's only in the initial stage of economic rise. So it also does not want to repeat the tragedy of the foreign, of the former Soviet Union or Germany to just a direct confront with the existing order, order. So I would say that my argument is that in such a dilemma, China is really trying its best to uh, follow a pragmatic approach and uh, try to keep a subtle balance. Thank you very much, very interesting observations. Though of course we should take into consideration that in international relations, not only the substance of your intentions matters, but also the reading of your action by the others matters as well. And in this sense, we have quite a plenty, plenty number of questions to be discussed. Uh, dear colleagues, I believe that the initial contributions have been inspiring enough for the questions from our audience. Unfortunately, my ability to see the room is a little bit limited by these lights. So, but please, uh, if anybody wants to, to intervene or ask a question, please raise your hands. Yes, please. Here. Can you give a microphone here to the left side? Uh, so go there and here. Thank you. This is Sajjotul from Iran. I enjoyed uh, the uh, panel. My question is to the latest speaker on Chinese rise. What are the challenges that you think China in this model that you described, that is not like a reliance on the global system, it is not like uh, Japan, it's not like the United States or Soviet Union, but for sure there are going to be challenges by international system on this model. 
what are the challenges that you think are there and how uh, China sees these challenges and how they want to cope with it? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that if we do have any other questions, we just pick it up and then we proceed to our, back to our speakers. Yes, here, the second table, please. Thank you, Heather Graby from Open Society. Um, we've heard a lot about economic development um, in terms that would have been very familiar to late 19th century diplomats. It's about uh, geographical proximity, it's about bilateral ties, diplomacy, political economy. But political economy in the past two decades has been turned upside down by digital, and it's about to be turned upside down again by climate. So how is this uh, part of the world that you've been talking about going to be affected by the increasing value of digital trade, and especially if fossil fuel dependency becomes the chief objective of most of the major consuming economies in the world? Um, how exactly is that going to change Chennai to Vladivostok? Thank you. So the third question, and then we, yes, gentlemen there, please. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sharma. I have a question to Chen. I was just wanting to know about China's climate policy because uh, the NDC submitted uh, by China is uh, proposing its uh, emission label ranging from uh, 18, 18 gigaton to 22 gigaton. And that's really contrary to the 1.5 degree Celsius uh, temperature restrictions. Uh, so what should be your uh, optimal climate policy so that you could uh, achieve this 1.5 degree Celsius temperature? Thank you. Thank you very much. I have been uh, informed by the organizers that we did exhaust our time. So I would like to start the closing remarks in the reverse order to start with you. Uh, Professor Chen, and then to, uh, after other speakers, to conclude, Mr. Norov. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I just uh, got uh, two questions. One is about the challenge that China um, identifies uh, as most serious challenge. The other is about the climate change policy. Uh, I would like to briefly uh, uh, first touch upon the climate policy. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with the specific policy you mentioned, but as far as the discussions I myself have been involved in, I have to say that China is still in the stage of keeping a quite tricky trade-off between uh, keeping the uh, develop, uh, 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 growth rate and the uh, envir ecological preservation. I myself have been uh, closely involved in the 14th develop National Develop Development Plan, and uh, when we talk to many grassroots um, governments, uh, when they make the uh, next uh, 14 five year plan, which means uh, the plan that dominates China's economic development uh, since 2021 to 2025, I can see that they are still struggling <laughs> with uh, keeping the, uh, like the air quality and also the uh, ecological related issue how they are going to bind, combine that with the economic development. So I would say that there's still a quite long way to go in my perspective for China to uh, really let the uh, ecological in indexes truly dominant, dominate it in their economic performance. Mm -hmm. And second question is about the uh, um, challenge that China identify as most. Uh, that's a quite big, big issue, but I do want to share uh, two of my uh, observations. Uh, one is that um, back home, there are actually quite intensive debates about where China is indeed now in today's global order. Uh, my personal perspective is that the so-called power shift, uh, like the, in the history, uh, there have been power shift from the UK to the United States. But my personal view is that the so-called power shift from the United States to, the, uh, to China hasn't even begun. Because um, nowadays, the existing international order is still being dominated by military security and strategic alliance. And the gap in this regard, the gap between China and the, the uh, uh, United States uh, is even wider than that between Russia and the, the United States. 
So my observation is that China is really at the, just the initial stage of economic rise. And this is also, I do believe, this is also the key understanding of the top Chinese leadership. And it is also why in recent years, if you look at the BRI, uh, initially many of the Western observers believe BRI is quite ambiguous and is quite extensive. But nowadays you really can see that BRI start to focus much more, for example, in uh, its, neighbor, its neighboring regions and start to focus on key strategic industries rather than just extend everything uh, to the corner of uh, across this, this world. So I would say that China is now trying to focus as much as possible in its neighboring areas, try to consolidate the, the interconnectivity, uh, which actually help to boost the trade and uh, economic interconnectivity. I would say that this is pretty much the focus. Thank you, Ash. Vance? Uh, just briefly, I mean, I, I think the, the observation that there's a, a, a bit of a 19th century cast to some of these conversations, um, I, I, I actually think that there's, uh, um, for better or worse, uh, a fair amount of accuracy to that, um, that, um, that some of the, the kind of universal character of, uh, of international relations, great power politics, um, of, as uh, other speakers have pointed out, a more multipolar um, uh, order um, does, uh, does mean that these, these uh, have historical echoes occur. With respect to, to digitization, though, uh, there's also a way in which you know, we, we tend to think that technology is a very 21st century challenge. But, but even there, too, I mean, I, as I think about the moment that we are in um, and how the major powers, India, China, United States, Russia, are going to have to navigate the, the, the decades ahead. I am struck that one of the parallels, unfortunately, between the late 19th century and today is that then, as now, um, we, we're in a moment of actually extraordinary technological progress. Um, and what happened then was that technological ingenuity outstripped moral and strategic imagination. Um, with, with ultimately truly catastrophic consequences um, for uh, the, the world order uh, of the, the 19th century uh, in 1914. As I think of where we are today um, and the, um, the technological arms races that are already accelerating um, between China, the United States, Russia, India, um, whether it's with respect to cyber, whether it's respect to artificial intelligence, whether it's with respect to space, any number of other fields, biotechnology, I think we, um, even as we, we compete, um, as we inevitably will, because we, we, uh, we do have um, uh, interests that are at times in tension, we need to be extraordinarily sensitive to what the implications of these technologies actually are. Um, because what we don't want is for competition to ultimately culminate in uh, conflagration. Um, and when you know, we can't even fully imagine what the implications of using some of these technologies are at scale in conflict. Uh, that is a, it's a, it, that's a moment of um, sobriety that I think, uh, and I hope, uh, in all of our capitals uh, among leaders, uh, we, we keep close to heart. Uh, thank you. Sergei. Uh, well, answering the question, I should first of all confess that political economy is still with us. Each decade, we read from the bestseller literature that the world has changed completely, that no lesson from the past can explain anything uh, for the future. But all these uh, predictions appear to be <laughs> fake news, by the way. Uh, if Well, digitalization is a great thing. It opens new opportunities of the unknown scale and scope. But still, if we look at the statistics, at the dynamics of business models, and the evolution of the social models, then we can clearly see that this is nothing that is turning the world upside down. Um, and by the way, the distance is also with us. Uh, if we look at the absolute figures of our cooperation with a particular country, everything can seem brilliant. But if we compare uh, the share of Russian trade with India uh, with the share of, say, Russian trade with Turkey, the latter is 2.5 times higher. 
even the share of Russian trade with Ukraine, despite all the political crisis, is higher than the share all of, of Russian trade with, with India. This is a clear consequence of economic distance, which we can at least minimize with the new initiatives. As for climate change, yes, this is a very fashionable topic, but I'm afraid it is a little bit overestimated. If we look at the history of the climate, we can see clear circles. All these cycles uh, are, you know, rather unpredictable. If we look at the notion of medieval climatic optimum, then we can readily note that nowadays temperatures is below the temperatures uh, that were observed uh, from uh, 8th to 12th centuries uh, of this eve. Uh, remember that no polar bear ever extinct uh, due to the uh, uh, rising temperatures from uh, 8th to 12th uh, century. I'm afraid that the same uh, will be true in the future. This doesn't mean that we should not pay attention uh, on uh, technologies to control uh, uh, climate change. But uh, I should warn you that if we like to compare uh, nowadays temperatures with the uh, pre-industrial temperatures, well, the industrial age uh, began uh, when the uh, so-called minor ice age was ended. So if we like to come back to the pre-industrial temperatures, we should think about skating on Thameza or uh, Amsterdam uh, canals. Is it good? N not too much, I think. So we should be uh, rather rational and cautious in our uh, climate initiatives. Thank you. Minister Tavari, I know that you need to run for the important parliamentary event and thank you for staying with us for a little longer. So what will be your take of our discussion and the questions? No, I think uh, in the past 25 years, the rise of the virtual civilization, uh, the digital age as we call it, has actually redefined the world in more ways than one. And uh, something which... Uh, does not get flagged enough. It's also redefined the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty does not mean the same thing in the digital age as it possibly meant two and a half decades ago. So therefore, as we go forth into the next decade or the decade after that, uh, the, the, the entire digital paradigm, the digital experience, especially in terms of the transfer of goods and services, is going to play an overwhelming role. It's not as if it is going to displace uh, the physical movement of goods and services completely because obviously there would be commodities and goods which would move over land and over the sea. But increasingly, you would see that with the, with the, with the world getting more connected, with more people coming online by the time maybe the entire population of planet Earth comes online, you would, in the next three or four decades, be living in an era which would be extremely and absolutely different from what we have really grown up in or the experiences that we have seen. So I think it's important for countries, especially in this part of the world, the emerging economies, to essentially also concentrate on this digital paradigm and think about leveraging digital convergences in order to improve the lives of their peoples, uh, rather than seeing it in the kind of confrontational paradigms of cyber conflict or uh, various other uh, very detrimental uses of digitization that unfortunately have come to define this paradigm also. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. <coughs> the purpose of our discussion was to give you some ideas yes, on the development of your institution as well uh, among the other purposes. So what will be your principal conclusion? Uh, thank you. I would like to answer the same to the question of the role of the digitalization. We now witnessing as internet space uh, and by uh, in darknet used by terroristic extremistic organization and drug traffickers for recruiting young uh, uh, children of our countries. In SEO area, it is 800 
million young men from 15 to 25 years. So we witnessing now is a concentration of the terrorist extremist group on the northern Afghanistan. That's why we are focusing on finding political solution in this country. And the, what we see this through internet, they are now recruiting young men to the activity on territory of Afghanistan or destabilizing situation in Central Asia. But at the same time, uh, today, digitalization, the digital economy and e-commerce began to play a very positive role. And three countries of Asia, as a China, India, and Russia is uh, leading in this area. I can say about China because now I am one year in China in my new position. 35% uh, of the uh, trade turnover, it is in uh, e-commerce. What is important, 55% who e in e-commerce, it is women. At the same time, only Alibaba last year created 40 million labor places, and they plan to 2036 create uh, 100 million labor place, uh, places, and at the same time to support, to, to uh, establish 10 million small and medium companies. That's why now we're focusing on is using digital economy advantages in developing our country and directing attention of our young population to the uh, proper way to be involved in digital uh, commerce and digital economy, not to spend mo much more time in the uh, social networks where they are recruited mostly. That's why I think this uh, interest is big among the big companies. And I had the meeting here with uh, startups uh, organization here in India. They have the same interest. And my conclusion that uh, three uh, leading countries as uh, China, uh, India, and Russia in SEO, uh, and the same time, uh, they have the big potential for positively have impact on economic development of our countries and the same time involving our young generation to proper way. But at the same time, when we're looking to the Asian continent, we should see, uh, take more attention to strengthening cooperation between uh, ASEO, ASEAN member states. We have the common interest for security, stability, economic development, logistic and transport. And at the same time, European Union, we proposing organizing some uh, meeting of think tanks of European Union, ASEO and ASEAN to talk about the potential of cooperation of our organization for benefit of our countries and our nation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And please let me express my gratitude for your contributions and invite our audience to applaud our speakers. Thank you.